All right, so far so good. Now, let's go straight for a hard one because I think you've done enough sort of settling in. Like, okay, I get the idea. I see how I go from here to here. We've got some interesting things before when we had a look at some of the trig functions and we're gonna see some interesting th things here as well. So let's do first um, sine x versus sine squared x and then we're gonna do sine x versus the square root of sine x, okay? Can you draw a couple of graphs just like we have here on each of them? Have both of them have sine x. Let's just go not to 2 pi. That's enough. Okay. And then um, we will compare what's going on. Oh, yeah. How tall are we doing it like? I'll let yeah. you have a think about that one. I'll let you have a think about that one. In fact, everything you need to work out the range is already on the board. What is the, um, what's the range of regular sine x, by the way? Negative one? To one. Negative one to one. Now, everything I've written on the board has to do with zero to one. So you got half of it covered, right? Do you think you can infer what's going on with the rest of it? Have a think about it. Oh, my gosh. In extension two, there's a whole lot of, I almost, one year, I almost um, printed out and like laminated. You know there's that, that yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. that meme, right? And I thought, I should print them out, put them on sticks so the students can just like hold them up at the appropriate moment. Um, but then I, common sense woke up, so I thought I'd better not do that. Do you guys need this? Can I rub it off? Yeah, square root x? Yeah, it's going. I'll leave x squared there for a minute. Jesus, it's not the. <laughs> okay, so here's sine x. I've stored enough for you. By the way, in case you haven't noticed, sine graphs, um, like most graphs, are usually easier to draw properly with nice curve when they're bigger. That's one of the reasons why I can draw really nice looking curves. It's not because I'm better, it's because they're bigger, right? So, just another argument for drawing nice big graphs. We're going to do sine squared first because it's actually, I think it's a little bit easier. Sin, square root of sine x is quite weird, okay? So, the first thing I'm going to do, because I'm going to compare it to that one over there. That's, that's when you square a function, right? The first thing is there are some critical points, some very important points, that um, are easy to identify right away because sine squared x is going to intersect with sine x at some very predictable spots. What spots are they? Firstly, all the zeros, okay? Because I'm squaring, yeah? So when you square zero there, and when you square zero there, and you square zero there, it stays put, okay? Where else is it going to intersect? Okay, right here at pi on two, because sine pi on two is one, you square one, and you get one. So far, so good? Okay. Now, there's one more predictable spot, which is not a point of intersection, but we can get it in the same way that we just got this one here, right? You square one, you get one. There's another value I can square that will give me one. Negative one. Negative one, down here, right? So when I square negative one, it's also gonna give me one, okay? Now keep in mind, when you square something, right, you lose the information about whether that thing was positive or negative, yeah? Like if I, if I have a machine, right, that squares things, and out pops out 25, right? If I ask you what came in, you don't know whether it was negative five or five. Do you agree with that? It'll still give you the same thing. Now, over here, you can see half of this graph is positive, half of this graph is negative, but these negative values, if I took the absolute value of those, are an exact copy of what's happening here. Do you agree? Okay. So the period of sine x is 2 pi, but the period of y equals sine squared x is just going to be pi, okay? Because from here to here, and from here to here, when you square it, are gonna look exactly the same. Does, does that make sense? Like the, the values here are the same values, just negative. Okay, now we have to work out, well, what's going on in here? And then I can just copy it over. Hmm, no. Hmm. Now, here I'm going to take advantage of those things that unfortunately you haven't quite learned yet, but some of you might have had some exposure to it. Um, we actually can find out what the gradient of sine x is all the time, and that's very useful for us when we're comparing it to things like that, okay? 
Um, the gradient of sine x, if you were to differentiate sine x, how many of you have encountered the derivative? How many of you have seen it? Okay, that's right. I will tell it to you. And as soon as you see it, you're like, oh, hold on a second. Just have a look at what the gradient is doing. Right? Just have a look at it. For example, it's got some stationary points. Where are they? Okay, the, the y values are 1 and minus 1, yeah. but the x values are pi on 2 and 3 pi on 2. Guess what function equals 0 at pi on 2 and 3 pi on 2? Answer, this guy, right? When you start off, you're positive. Then you've got this big chunk in here, which is negative. Do you see? Can, have you got cos x tracing through in your mind? Do you see it? Okay. So anyway, you will encounter this more formally later. But the important thing for me that that means is that the gradient here at the origin, the gradient of sine x at the origin is equal to what? What happens when you put 0 in here? You get 1. So the gradient here is 1. Now, I know what happens to another function which has a gradient of 1 when I square it. Right? Have a look. See what's happening there? You square it and you get a stationary point. Hmm. So what that means is I am going to get a stationary point here. Okay, it's going to be a stationary point there. Okay. Now, you can also see, again, this, is, this will come out when you start to look at the calculus and you can differentiate this and see what happens, right? You are going to get another stationary point here, up the top, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you the question, what's therefore going to happen in between here? Because basically what you do here is going to be reversed because the function is reversed. Where am I going to be? Am I going to be... Is, this, is sine squared going to be above or below? It's going to be below, right? Because all of these va values are less than 1, uh, except for that one, right? So when you square a value that's less than 1, you go lower, right? So therefore, the shape you're getting in order to stay underneath that blue line and also meet both of those stationary points that you're going to get has to look like that, okay? It's kind of like the, um, the cube root of x, actually, if you, if you remember encountering that. Okay. And basically, once you've got that, everything else just kind of follows suit. You went from 0 to pi on 2 going up, you're going to go from pi on 2 to pi going down. So you do the same dance in reverse, like that. You come down to another stationary point. And that's it. From 0 to pi, that's the period of this function. I just need to copy it again, like that. And at the same, like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay. So now I held your hand through that. I want you to have a brief moment to think about. Again, remember, you were, you looked at this and you're like, man, it's so obvious, right? And then I teased out a few insights in there, and the insights I got here were useful to hear. They told me where the stationary points would be. I want you to think about the square root of sine x, and I want you to use root x as your kind of like pattern to follow and, and thing to gain some insights out of. I'll give you a few minutes to get a head start on me and then I'll draw by it.